discuss um, the issue of open government issues and challenges, and um, we will also look a little bit at the opportunities and um, why does it matter to to discuss um, open government. Um, my name is Veronica Cresto. Um, I'm saying hello to all of you from Tishino, Moldova. Um, I am a former Diplo Foundation um, Internet Governance Capacity Building Program Tutor and Research Supervisor. Um, since April this year, um, I um, am sitting on the Civil Society Steering Committee of the Open Government Partnership, Partnership or initiative that we will discuss a little bit about today. Um, in Moldova, I'm a coordinator of a civil society working group on e-government and open government, which is a part of the National Participation Council. Um, National Participation Council is actually a civil society advisory body to the government of Moldova. It's one of the interesting tools that we have here in Moldova uh, in terms of participation and bringing the voice of the civil society organizations. Um, with this, um, I would like to um, challenge you a little bit um, uh, by uh, sharing an interesting um, analysis or interesting result of an analysis that is not necessarily related to open government directly. It relates to the internet and uh, um, trusting government and citizen compliance. Um, this interesting study that I came across uh, some time ago suggests that the more time you know, we spend on internet, we spend online, the lower the degree of trust in government is and the lower the level of citizen compliance is. It's amazing, interesting, interesting enough, isn't it? Because it's, it looks like, you know, the governments are trying to do their best to provide access to access, to provide high-speed internet, to create infrastructure, um, trying to bring different technology and different uh, initiatives. And as a result, you know, the more we are online, the, the less trust we have in our, in, in our government. Um, it is a um, it is a really challenging aspect because um, the same uh, the same study uh, says that um, you know such negative impact or effects of uh, of the internet can be moderated through increased um, um, use of e-government or through engaging citizens via e-government. Um, the reason I'm sharing this with you is because. There has been a considerable confusion and misunderstanding of the of the concepts e-government and open government, and, and then we have the third element, which is internet. And at Diplo Foundation, we have been uh, talking and sharing and working a lot on the issues of internet government. But let me go back a little bit to the issue of e-government. Um, if the negative effect of the internet can be moderated through e-government, which stands for, you all know, you know, um, electronic government or e-government or internet government, digital government. This is, this is actually um, our government interacting with their citizens, with their uh, businesses, with their employees, and with other governmental agencies through digital interaction. So e-government is a specific tool in which government does its business in regards to the key, uh, key stakeholders that I mentioned. Now, what is then the difference between the e-government and open government? And uh, how, how did it uh, happen that, uh, that there is um, uh, this misunderstanding and confusion um, regarding, uh, regarding these two, two concepts? Um, at the beginning uh, of, um, of, of, the, of the discussion today, I asked you to think about, you know, what is open government for you? What do you believe or what do you think that open government stands for? If it's not e-government, then what is, it? what is it? And I would really like to ask you to use the chat window that, that you see uh, on the top and to briefly write two or three key words or ideas that you have um, regarding, you know, what does open government mean for you? And I really, I really look uh, forward to, to see some of, the, some of the ideas written in the chat. And we will start um, further the discussion on open government from here. Transparency. 
I see Annie says it's transparency. Mm -hmm. Siranush is saying that open government is a government that is uh, transparent and is not corrupted. Thank you very much. Any other ideas? What is an open? How do you know that your government is open? Mm -hmm. William is saying uh, uh, participation. Excellent. What else? What else? So how else you know that the government is open? Okay, Elena, Elena uh, is saying that comprehensive information is available to the public. Radu, thank you very much, effective services. Okay, thank you, Eduard, involve citizens in decision-making processes. Okay, and Clyde is saying accountability, and open government is a government that is accountable. Stephanie, when certain information is ready available online, that's an indicator of, of the government being open. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you all readily. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, if we look into the, into the concept of open government, you can find lots of descriptions and, and definitions. What you see here on the screen are just some of the core uh, definitions that, uh, that you, will, um, you will come across. An open government is a governing doctrine which holds that citizens have the right to access the documents and proceedings of the government to allow for effective public oversight. Um, this idea of the government being open, it goes back to the 17th and 18th century, which was very interesting uh, for me to, uh, to, to read about. It goes to the time of enlightenment. And that was the period when, you know, the scientists and the philosophers and the thinkers of that period um, looked at the, at the way to reform the society using reason, challenging ideas grounded in tradition and faith, and advancing knowledge through the scientific method. Today, if you, if you meet open government advocates around the world, they will immediately tell you that open government is linked to the passing of freedom of information legislation. And they are perfectly right. Some of you have already mentioned the key words related to open government, and this is exactly what some other schools of thought say, that an open government is in the first place a transparent government, is participatory and collaborative. If you look at transparency aspect, transparency, indeed, as Stephanie, as uh, Elena mentioned, and as, uh, as Hiranush mentioned, Ali mentioned, transparency does mean sharing data and information and is often credited with generating government accountability. If you look at the participation, participation is another important aspect of the, of aspect of the open government. It means hearing and implementing ideas from as many kinds of people and organizations as possible. And collaboration, you know that it's not only uh, related to the open government, collaboration is, is in everything. Collaboration means actually engaging in ongoing conversation with employees, public, and, and this, is, this is an attempt to work together to solve problems. So that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's another perspective of, of what an open government is. Now, um, I'm sure many of you have heard about the Open Government Partnership. Have you? If yes, can you please write either yes or no in the chat? I want to see how many people uh, came across uh, the Open Government Partnership, have been involved in this, heard about this. Yes, yes. Okay. So I see a number of you heard about this partnership, which is, which is very good. Those of you who haven't, um, this is a good uh, opportunity to, uh, to find out about. Yes, okay, thank you, Radu. Thank you, William, Piranush, Sean, and Elena. Yes, Ellie, many thanks. Um, the Open Government Partnership. This is an effort at the global level to make government better. It's, it's a very ambitious attempt to make governments better. And as part of this Open Government Partnership, which is a multilateral initiative, um, 
we aim to secure concrete commitments from government to promote transparency, empower citizens, fight corruption, and harness the potential of the ICT and of the technologies in general to strengthen governance. The link that, uh, that is provided on the screen will take you to, to the web page of the Open Government Partnership. It's interesting um, uh, that, uh, you know, this, this Open Government Partnership uh, has been created or formed, as you, you will see, by eight founding governments. This is Brazil, Indonesia, Mexico, Norway, Philippines, South Africa, United Kingdom, and United States that endorsed an open government declaration and announced their country's action plans. Uh, it happened uh, in September 2011, and today we have 30 countries that joined open government partnership. Uh, partnership. I, I want to ask you, are you aware whether your country is part of the OGP, open government partnership, or not? You know, the countries you come from. Yes. Okay, Ireland is part of that. What are the countries we have in the room and are part of the of the OGP, Open Government Partnership? Okay, Tirana, she's not sure about Armenia. Okay. Okay. Radu, what country are you from? Okay, Egypt. Okay, okay. Thank you, Sia. Okay. You have the possibility, thank you, thank you all very much. You have the possibility to check whether your country is part of the Open Government Action Plan, uh, 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 both the Open Government Partnership, and whether your country has prepared an action plan on open government by accessing the, the link that is on the screen. Um, indeed, uh, the, the initiative started with eight founding governments. And then in the second wave, there were 36 governments that joined. And my country, Moldova and Malta, um, have, have joined uh, this initiative uh, uh, soon after, after September 2011. Um, why is this partnership important? And why is it important for us? First of all, it is an expression of a common commitment to the principles of open government. It's a mechanism to support concrete actions by the governments and civil society. Um, if your country participates in this initiative, it has to deliver a country action plan that stipulates very specific commitments on open government. In each country, it's not just the government sitting and drafting and coming up with, with an action plan. The commitments are developed through a multi-stakeholder process with an active engagement of citizens and civil society. Of course, each country has its own mechanisms, has its own consultation process. And there are a lot of sharing around, you know, how to conduct the consultations in a much more effective manner that you ensure a multi-stakeholder approach at different levels. What is also important to mention is the independent reporting mechanism. First of all, if your country is part of this partnership, it has to provide a self-assessment report once the action plan, uh, the implementation of specific actions, for instance, for one year or two years, have been implemented. Civil society is also playing a very important role, and civil society does also conduct evaluation of the way or degree to which the government did commit to certain commitments or not. And number three, there is the independent reporting mechanism. We are sending researchers and evaluators or identifying researchers and evaluators in the member countries, and they are using a specific methodology, specific tool to evaluate the degree to which there has been um, implementation, a constructive implementation of the commitments or not. Myself, as a member of the steering committee of the Open Government Partnership, um, we, and, and, and as a steering committee, we are very keen to see the first reports coming out this October, uh, reports that have been uh, uh, elaborated in the, in the first eight founding uh, countries uh, that, that I shared about. Um, the next 36 countries are going to go through the independent reporting mechanism uh, at, the, at the end of this year. 
So actually what is interesting to, to mention is that each country is kind of having a test, a, is passing an examination. Um, and the steering committee should decide at some point or another what should we do with the countries that fail to meet the, the commitments and the principles of an open government. What do governments need to address as part of the action plans? You all mentioned at the very beginning that a, a government that is open should be transparent, should um, be participatory, should be accountable, and you are perfectly right. The four core open government principles deal with transparency, citizen participation, accountability, technology, and innovation. These are the four core elements that have to be on the basis of any initiative that is put in an action plan in open government. If you look on transparency, governments have to commit that information on government activities and decisions is open, comprehensive, timely, freely, available to the public, and meets basic open data standards. If you look at citizen participation, I, can, I often hear governmental representatives saying, we engage citizens. You know, we engage them in decision making. How do you engage them? And then they say, well, we put online all the information and, and this is how we engage them in, in, the, in the decision making process. Well, citizen participation does not mean only putting information or making information available. Citizen participation mean, means mobilizing constructively citizens in public debate. You really need to interact with the citizens. You really need to respect some basic principles for citizen engagement and, and have citizens as, as partners in the development process. So once a country or a government is part of this process, it should seek to provide different tools and different instruments to engage citizens, be it at the local level, at the regional level, at the national level. Accountability. You know accountability is another important another important pillar or another important principle. Principle. There are rules and regulations and mechanisms in place that call upon government actors to justify their actions, to act upon the criticisms or requirements um, that, that the government have made, and accept responsibility for their own failures to perform in respect to, to a, a law or to, to some commitment. Technology and innovation is another important pillar. And governments have to acknowledge that today, without technology, without innovation, actually there is no way out. This is a, a huge potential. This is a huge uh, opportunity that has to be uh, valued by, by the government. So the governments are expected to embrace the importance of providing citizens with open access to technology, to understand the role of new technologies in driving innovation, and to increase the capacity of their own citizens to use technology. And there are again several tools, several instruments to do that. So these are the core pillars, the core principles that any government has to respect, to undertake, and to use as a basis for any actions that are coming um, as part of an action plan. What do you think of them? What's your, what's your Opinion on this? Is anything missing from the from the pillars? Is there any other pillar that should be added, or this is something that might be enough for um, you know for governments to endorse and to respect? <laughs> Whether United States passed the test, we will figure out. Um, thanks, William. Um, United States, as uh, as well as the other seven countries that are founding members of the Open Government Partnership. They are today undergoing through the independent reporting mechanism, and we will know the results at the end of October because the reports will be made available uh, during the Open Government Partnership um, Annual Summit that will take place in London. Um, I will talk more about the summit a little bit later. So we don't know yet. We don't know yet. Any, any other questions or any other? immediate reactions to the key pillars. Do you think these are the key pillars that mm -hmm, transparency measures? Okay. Okay, any other? Sean, is this a question or a, um, 
a comment regarding transparency. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, Sean. We need to see this as, as more than pillars. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Radu, um, public opinion, Radu is saying that in our country, public opinion plays a minor role in influencing the government. Um, okay, thank you very much for this immediate reaction. We will have a more more time to, uh, to, to discuss this um, in the second part of the presentation. Yes, Serrano if all four principles will be in place, then the government will be working properly. Uh huh. But only if all four. Okay, so Serrano is highlighting the importance of all the four pillars and, um, um, you know, emphasizing that actually if one is missing, then you will have a disbalanced uh, uh, puzzle, if, if I can put it this way. Mm -hmm. Timur, maybe inclusiveness is missing. Minorities need to have access to information. Hmm. Inclusiveness might be uh, inclusiveness might be well integrated in the in the citizen participation, and I think it's not uh, yes yes ethnic minorities, and it's um, it deals with citizen participation and with the with a number of tools that the government use to reach out to all um, stakeholder groups to all um, marginalized communities to to everyone to every single citizen regardless of the of the ethnic uh, origin or or any other criteria mm -hmm. pluralism and responsiveness thank you Elena. okay thank you thank you all very much wonderful ideas and you are experts on on open government <laughs> okay tech and innovation should be government stephanie is asking whether whether under the fourth pillar technology and innovation should government provide open access to technology, or does this also include open gov through technology such as such as the internet? Steph, this includes both. This includes this includes both both aspects. Okay. Now that the, thank you all very much. Now that the, the pillars are or the principles are clear, um, let's look into the um, to the grant challenges. Our governments. Our governments are expected to respond, if you look on the screen, to respond to one or two grant challenges that are listed below. These challenges are related to improving public services, increasing public integrity, more effectively managing public resources, creating safer communities, and increasing corporate accountability. So um, basically, any of our governments have the possibility to decide which of the five challenges they would like to address as part of the country's action plan. For example, how, but how does it work? How or how should it work? Imagine that um, the government picks uh, for picks the improving public services um, uh, challenge and wants to address the issue of education. Um, for education, and we go both back to the pillars, any initiative for education or any action put in the action plan on education, on, on, on improving public education component, should have specific tools for transparency, ensuring transparency of that initiative, should stipulate very clearly the tools that the government is going to use to ensure citizen participation, ways government is going to keep accountable to its citizens and to the beneficiaries of the service, and what kind of technology and what innovation, technological innovation, the government is going to put in place for that specific um, action or, or activity um, or objective that is uh, going to be part of the action plan. Um, increasing public integrity, as you can see, uh, these are commitments uh, that are expected from the government in, in regards to corruption and public ethics, access, access to information, campaign finance reforms, media and civil society freedom, um, creating safer communities, commitments that are expected uh, from the government are related to public safety, security sector, disaster and crisis response, response environmental threats, 
So um, um, you will have access to these uh, five challenges um, after the after the webinar, and you'll have the possibility to to look into all the sub uh, sub priorities or kind of commitments that type of commitments that are expected from from the government. Um, what is important to share with you, and this is my personal personal um, uh, subjective, if you want, uh, opinion or position on that. The greatest challenges associated with implementing, you know, these this challenges and the four core principles of, of open government is a, um, a very um, low understanding of the concept and philosophy of open government. And this is something that is um, very dominant at the government level. At least this is the case, uh, our case in Moldova. Um, there is a limited capacity to elaborate ambitious commitments as part of, uh, of an action plan. You know, commitments that follow those core, core principles and, and respond to one of the grand challenges. And another, another challenge is associated with sustainability, long-term vision related to open government. You know, how do we ensure that the, our governments do not come only with one-time action plans on open government, like we have one for 2012 or 2013, or right now we are in the process of coming up with a plan for 2014 or 2015. How, how this process is going to continue on, an, on a normal basis, on a regular basis? That's, that's, that's a question that, um, and, and that's a challenge that is still to be, uh, to be addressed by those engaged in, in this process. Another interesting challenge from my perspective, um, and the reason, uh, the reason I put it on the screen is, is because, um, you know, our countries, most of our countries are having representative democracies. We vote once in four years. And that's it, as citizens. We do not participate. We do not have the, the, the opportunities to engage in decision-making processes at, at different levels, often frequently, you know, once a month or, or, or twice a month. And open government as a, as a concept, as a philosophy, it actually presupposes that citizens are engaged more actively at different levels. And it's actually open government is, is using participatory democracy or is having participatory democracy at the core. Uh, and, and when you talk to government officials and you insist that they consult the documents in a specific way, that they put online some decisions at least a number of days before the decision is going to be made, um, when you insist that they invite you for the for the public debates, where the public debates are conducted in a in a comprehensive, in a in a correct way, then they look at you and they why why do you need this? Why are you asking? What do you want from us? We want you to really endorse the principles of an open government, and that implies using participatory democracy tools. You provide citizens with information. You consult them, you engage them in, in, in and you, you, you foster the participation of the citizens in different decision making processes and in policy development. So this challenge of not understanding the fact that we are actually using, you know, two dominant type of, of democracies, if you want, that are coming together and that are part of the, of the open government philosophy. As long as this is not going to be understood by by those who elaborate policies, by the government officials, by the civil society, we are going to have clashes, you know, of different opinions and resistance and frustrations, and uh, um, you know, we will always have um, uh, reactions like this. This is this is not our responsibility. We are not supposed to do this in in a certain way. Um, why does it matter in general? Why? Open government matters um, because citizens start having a different role in the decision-making process. And when you as a citizen start playing a different role, you actually articulate your needs. You communicate about your needs. You communicate about your, your problems. 
you share your solutions and you start playing a new role in the development processes at, at your community level, at the country level. By playing a different role, citizens contribute to the increasing, uh, to, the, to, to the increase of the quality of public services because at the end of the day, a government that committed to be open and transparent and participatory and accountable, it needs to take into account your feedback and your recommendation and to improve the services that it delivers to you. Another important, important uh, aspect is related to the potential of the internet and the technology in general. Um, we often see governments endorsing, you know, huge e-transformation agendas at the country level, going to, you know, mobile ID, to mCloud, but it doesn't, it doesn't always have the capacity to understand, you know, the, the developmental processes behind the technology, the content, the people behind the technology. And this is, this is something that really matters. If a government committed to endorse the open government principles, then automatically it will have to understand the essence of the technology. And it will not look at the technology and at the internet as, as, as a, something separate, but it will start infusing it into, into the broader developmental agenda. New ways of interaction between, between citizens and government. Yes, open government means new ways of interaction. This is actually something we are not used to. There are, there are so many countries around the world that uh, uh, have citizens uh, who have never participated in any debate, whose opinions have never been um, taken into consideration, who have never expressed any, any concern. And with, with opening up the government, we are actually bringing new ways of interaction between citizens and the government. And Another important thing is that open government is not just about the government. It is about each and every one of us. You know, as civil society, as uh, donor organizations, as businesses, as citizens, we have to all be aware of the, of the, of the transparency aspect, of the accountability, of, the, of engaging our beneficiaries in the decision-making processes. At the end of the day, we are all Implementing initiatives that are aiming at improving the quality of life, improving the, the services that we deliver, you know, depending on the capacity and the role that we play. But in doing that, we have to commit ourselves to the principles of, of open government. We have to learn how to be transparent. We have to learn how to be accountable. We have to learn how to engage those who work with us in a more constructive way. And of course, we have to learn how to use technology. We, we often, I still see so many, for example, NGOs using um, so much paper, doing so much paperwork um, when, when they can use the data and, uh, and they can create interactive applications or they can create interactive platforms for, for getting feedback and ideas uh, from, from their beneficiaries. Technology is something we have to learn how to use in a, in a very effective way. It will improve our own work, and uh, and we will um, we will be able to to generate more uh, more um, development. And and open government is actually a new way of thinking. And why am I saying it's a new way of thinking? And I see some comments here that uh, from from Angela that there is a danger in in in. Um, in thinking that internet solves open data problems. Um, okay, um, I, um, what I wanted to highlight is that, and, and why am I saying that open government is a new way of thinking, is a new thinking paradigm. You can actually have an open government even without not having any technology in place. You may not have any, any internet, any software or hardware, you can still have an open government because there are other other tools and other mechanisms that can be put in place by the government to ensure transparency and accountability and participation to, to their citizens. So that's why I'm saying it's a new way of thinking. Um, and uh, yes, indeed, technology will not 
will not solve it, but technology plays a really, a really important role in the development today. Um, opportunities. Yes, open government provides emerging opportunities. And you have heard about open data, open education, open health, open budgets, open cities, open embassies, open, you name it. There are opportunities that emerge once the governments start endorsing the open government agenda. Because you start looking at different sectors from the perspective of the core principles of open government. Can you imagine in education, for instance, because it's one of my, one of my, uh, education is one of my passions. If you look at education, imagine what a change you can produce in bringing, you know, both parents and students and teachers and school administration in, in making decisions about, um, you know, about a, a, a curriculum or about textbooks or about uh, syllabus that should be taught um, at the school level. Um, so imagine, imagine what kind of, of developments can be generated if you engage the key decision makers or the key beneficiaries in, in, in discussions and debates around what is needed, what is important, what meets the needs of the, of the today's rapidly growing society and so on and so forth. Open cities, if you look at open cities, if you look at open embassies, we have so many, um, uh, you know, uh, citizens working abroad. We, for instance, Moldova has more than one million of citizens abroad. How Moldovan embassies are engaging our citizens in decision-making processes back to our back to home countries? To what degree they are they are they are involved in in approving or disagreeing uh, with with certain decisions or strategies or um, you know, documents that are being approved. These are people that are sending remittances back home and their, their position and their voice should be heard. And once you embrace this concept to the level of embassies, to the level of, uh, you know, diplomatic missions, we might have a different, uh, a different, uh, you know, different results and uh, a different voice and different perspective. So these are, these are just few of the emerging opportunities. If open, if governments manage to implement correctly, you know, the, the, the open government principles, then we will see these emerging opportunities, these emerging um, issues addressed at different sector, sectors. Um, you, those in the room, um, my dear participants, um, you can also get involved in the, in the debates and in the discussions around open government. And I personally believe there is a great potential and there is a lot of interesting, um, um, you know, uh, input that is being generated today around this issue. Um, there is uh, an Open Government Partnership Annual Summit and uh, we have issued a call for proposals. Um, and uh, you, can, you can have a look at that and see maybe um, any, some of you would be interested to submit a work for proposal for the summit. There is an Open Government Partnership blog where you can, um, you know, you can subscribe to and you can uh, contribute with the uh, uh, different articles and different stories from your country. Um, Open Government Partnership has a Facebook page, um, so you can subscribe to that and uh, get updates and uh, see what is happening, uh, at least in the, in the frame of the 60 countries that are part of the Open Government Partnership. Um, you are free to contact me. Um, uh, this is the email address. I'm very active on Facebook and LinkedIn, and I will be more than happy now to take um, any questions or comments or observations. Uh, uh, and I will be more than happy to go back to some some of the ideas that I shared previously. So, and and I already see lots of um, discussions uh, here in the chat. Very good. Um, now we have less than um, less than 20, 20 minutes, yes, for, for questions and answers. And um, as I said, please feel free to share any of your ideas. Um, I'm sure to some of the questions you can also provide answers because you bring a lot of experience from your from your countries, from your background. So please feel free to share and um, 
let's let's continue building on uh, you know on the on the issue of open government and and what does it really mean and how does it uh, really work and how we can improve the quality of um, lives in our countries with an open government so the floor is yours Okay, Siranus so has already access to the Open Government Partnership page. Okay, very good. Subscribe, uh, Siranus, to the to the Facebook page of the Open Government Partnership, and uh, you will receive um, uh, regular updates on on the work behind the, the the partnership. Excellent. Any comments? Any any suggestions? By the way, um, if you are interested to join. Um, uh, some working groups. Um, Open Government Partnership um, has uh, some some working groups around uh, specific uh, things like open parliament, uh, open budget. Um, we will soon start uh, piloting those working groups. If you are interested, I can send you the links and uh, contact um, persons in charge, and you can join those groups. Um, and uh, this is another way you can you can learn more about uh, about uh, the initiative. Sean is asking, what is the best way for OGP to provide broad general metrics for how well progress on action plans are carried out? Sean, as I said, if I understood your question right, um, as I said, uh, the Open Government Partnership has, um, has an, um, an independent reporting mechanism. Uh, there is a specific evaluation tool that is going to be applied uh, in regards to all uh, 60 countries that are part of the open, open Government Partnership. So independent researchers and evaluators are going to go to each of these countries and they are going to carry out that evaluation. Um, once the evaluation is ready, it will be presented uh, to the steering committee of the Open Government Partnership. And depending on the results, uh, we are going to decide whether we give a warning sign, sign to the to the member country, and we um, ad, we advise on specific actions and specific aspects that the the government should look at in order to improve, redress the situation, so that the next evaluation, the next um, um, evaluation, uh, turns out uh, uh, much more positive. Stephanie is saying technology can offer so much thought. I think open government should still benefit from the advantages offered by technology without being dependent on, on it. Um, indeed, uh, in, indeed, Stephanie, uh, you know, technology is something that we cannot deny anymore. We cannot say that it's so complicated and it's so difficult to, to, to endorse. This is still something that I often hear among the governmental representatives um, especially the generation after 50 plus who are still complaining that it's so difficult to learn how to use, you know, the super sophisticated uh, technology and uh, for them it's much easier to do their job on the paper. It takes time. It takes time uh, to, to understand that, as I said, uh, uh, technology itself is actually a new, generating a new way of thinking. But, um, of course, we cannot rely only on technology. As I said, open government does not necessarily mean using um, only uh, technology. Open government is, is a combination. Today, it is a combination of both online and offline. You can, as a government, you can, you can have your community sessions, you know, interactive community sessions with different stakeholder groups on different issues in a village, in a remote area, in a city, in a district, and you can still find ways to hear out what citizens need, what the problems they face, what solutions they seek to have implemented by the government. So indeed, it's not only about technology. It is important. Um, it is a very important and powerful tool, but an open government does not rely only on technology. Uh, Sean is asking whether there are any metrics available yet to see how these evaluations will be carried out. Sean, I can share with you the, the, the tool itself. 
Um, I think I don't have access now to the names of the people in countries who are carrying out uh, these evaluations. Uh, but then the evaluation reports will be made uh, available online, um, uh, you know, during the during the summit that will take place in London, um, October 31st, November 1st. So I will uh, I can send you I can I can send you um, this 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 details. Okay. Okay. I see some. Um, I also see some 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 comments here. Any any other from from your perspective? Um, what what do you think is most difficult um, from your perspective to be done in your respective countries? What would hinder the implementation of these core principles of the open government? What what do you think would would make it difficult or makes it even difficult today? You know, you from with your experiences, with your background, what what are the biggest challenges from your perspective? William is saying getting the human beings to commit themselves. Okay. Indeed, human um, human human aspect is um, is is a very important one. It. The change in our minds, the change in our thinking does not happen overnight. We we really need a great deal of capacity building, um, and we really need to train and to learn, you know, how to how to open up governments by by doing this uh, uh, by doing our jobs, our work uh, in in a in a open and, and transparent and accountable manner. Um, Tiranush is saying citizen participation inclusiveness. Indeed, it's difficult. It's difficult to engage citizens because especially if they are not used to being consulted, they they often perceive it as uh, as something negative. There is a, the immediate reaction, what do you want from us? Uh, especially in the former Soviet countries, this is something that, that I often observe. People have not have never been asked about what they think. Have never been asked to question or to challenge, and now whew, you want you want them to to, to generate you uh, to give a feedback on on some strategies, to give a feedback on some local development agenda or 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 something like that. And of course, it takes time. It takes time, and you need to explain that you know this is part of the normal process. This is part of a new way of doing things. It's a part part of the new relationship between the government and and the citizens. Mm, so Sean is saying that from Irish perspective, challenge of coming up with an action plan that accepts a particular challenge and can be maintained as a process over time. Um, in this, Sean, um, because any any particular challenge, it cannot. I mean, you cannot fix a problem um, depending, of course, on the on the complexity of the problem. You cannot fix it in a very short time. You need to think of the sustainability aspect, and then. How you ensure that, for example, in 2016 or 2017, you still address as a government that particular challenge, but you take it at a different level. So there has to be a communication, if you want, between uh, between one action plan and another action plan. And one important aspect I, I wanted to share with you is that, um, you know, in long-term perspective. I don't think countries will need, like in five years' time or, or seven years' time, I don't think our countries will necessarily need separate action plans on open government. My personal belief is that, you know, in this particular phase, our governments learn how to how to rethink their initiatives and commitments from an open government perspective. But in the future, any sector, any country's uh, strategy, any any documents, anything done by the government should have at the core, you know, the principles of transparency, accountability, citizen engagement, technology, and so on and so forth. So in long run, I, I don't actually see uh, that much effort put on new action plans rather than infusing the culture of open government in everything that the government, civil society, business community does on a regular basis. So, so that's 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 the way I see the the sustainability of, of this initiative. But it takes time. It takes so much effort and time to 
to to train uh, you know people involved in this to make them aware of of the impact of the on the consequences. Um, it, it's really a, a great deal of effort. Uh, Radu is saying that one of the challenges is citizen participation, uh, similar like uh, Siranush. Uh, Siranush is also uh, saying that another challenge is lack of trust towards the government. Indeed, Siranush, um, um, because the old governments uh, often fail to, to be transparent and to be accountable, and we often see many, um, uh, many actions that contradict to the commitment that the government made. And of course, if this repeats over and over again, citizens um, um, lose trust in, in government. Um, and that's, that's a very important thing that the government should, should look at and should consider because, um, you know, this energy of frustration and, and lack of trust in the government, it, it generates mass, uh, mass frustrations. And then you, you end up in having people on streets and you end up in having people frustrated and, and uh, disappointed and leaving the country. There are so many negative consequences of the government not being able to build trust of its citizens. Indeed, I, I, I do hope, I, I naively, you know, um, um, still hope that with an open government agenda, um, th there are chances for governments to, 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 to build this trust in, um, in, in citizens and to have citizens uh, having more, um, uh, more, more trust in government. Sean is saying that, um, yes, have to really build a sense that it is your government in Ireland now, but ethos in Canada was that uh, it was my government. Okay. Um, you know, Sean, it was a very interesting uh, situation that happened to me some years ago, um, about, I think, uh, 13 or 14 years ago. I visited Denmark for the first time, and we went to, to a local, um, to, a lo to one of the mayors. Um, and the Moldovan delegation that was um, that was part of the discussion was asking several questions. Um, and um, uh, the, my colleagues they wouldn't understand uh, immediately the the answer that uh, that the Danish uh, mayor of a particular community was providing. At the end of the because the question was related to the taxes, how much taxes Danish people pay to their government? It was something something around this issue. And he was, he, the, the, the mayor did not understand our question. So we repeated it once again and once again. And at the end of the day, what he said, you know, at the end of this discussion, he said, look, we are the government. We pay to ourselves. People are the government. And for us, it was so difficult to understand this, this, uh, this concept and this principle. And it does really, um, it, it does really, um, you know, make you think that um, the government and, and open government, it's, it's actually part of a culture. It's, um, it's, it's, it's something that comes with traditions, with generations, with, with centuries, if you want. It cannot happen overnight. We are absolutely confident and, and sure about this, but it is important that um, other countries, and especially developing countries around the world, they do at least get a chance to participate um, and citizens participate in decision-making processes. And who knows, maybe in 100 years or 200 years, at least citizens of Moldova will say, it's our government, it's we are the government. Um, I, I still hope that that will happen one day. Indeed, indeed, Sean, indeed, they impact history as Canadians do. Um, Nohai is saying that one of the challenges you mentioned is government understanding of the concept. So my question is, how can we raise awareness of governments, especially that this is where the whole process starts? Um, Nohai, to give you an example, uh, tomorrow uh, I'm going to uh, have a session on open government with representatives of the Ministry of Education, because Ministry of Education has to come up with some commitments for their sector. But for them, it's so difficult to come up with commitments because they do not understand um, you know the, the the concepts and the the the, the ideas behind the uh, open government. So at this stage, we as civil society working group on e-government, open government. As I said at the beginning, we are a working group within the National Participation Council. We are providing voluntary support to the sectors 
that struggle in identifying specific commitments. So we work with them. We kind of deliver a capacity building on, on what open government is. But in long run, I think it's um, absolutely crucial for the, the educational system itself to um, infuse some uh, curriculum, some model lessons on, on open government so that our children, the young generation, catches up on, on this concept and they, once they are becoming, you know, real citizens of their communities and their countries, they can hold their governments uh, be open and transparent and accountable to them. So it's both, uh, it's both, um, you know, um, raising awareness with those whom we have in the system. We cannot change them. We cannot replace them. They are there. We need to work with what we have. And there is much energy that is going to be put in place. And on the other hand, in the long run, we have to think about how to infuse this concept into the school curriculum, high school curriculum, university curriculum. Whom do we teach about this concept? Who teaches about this concept? Because this is where, um, you know, the sustainability of the, of, of the initiative will, uh, will, will come from. Um, I know that many of you are also really very much involved in the internet governance um, uh, debate, um, you know, be it with Diplo Foundation or at the international level with, uh, within the Internet Governance Forum. One of the important outcomes of, uh, of uh, having the open government agenda endorsed at the country level will generate more active participation um, uh, of the government in the Internet Governance uh, debate. Because, um, um, you know, once you start using the technology, once you start using Internet more actively, providing access, um, dealing with privacy, uh, personal data, public data, then as a government you will start wondering and then thinking, oh, okay, what's happening in regards to internet governance in country X, Y, or Z? So um, um, Moldova, who has been very passively involved, Moldova government has been passively involved in the IGF itself. I hope that, you know, we are going to have a more active engagement in, in the not only on open government, but as a consequence in the, in the in broader internet governance um, debate. Um, and I think that's another um, important um, outcome of the open government initiative. What do you think? Will it, will it affect? Um, will it impact uh, governments? Uh, will the open government agenda force governments to look also into the internet governance debate? Probably I should, um, I should leave this uh, as an open question for you to think, uh, to think after the webinar. Well, I think we have only um, a couple of minutes left. If there are any, any comments, any, any impressions, any observations, um, um, feel free to post them in the chat and I will be very happy to, to read them. So. And thank you very much. Well, I see you start thanking me. Um, I was actually still expecting some, uh, some comments on, on this uh, philosophy of open government, but thank you very much for, for joining and um, um, if, in case you have additional questions, you can um, you can really uh, contact me uh, by email. I really look forward to engage with you in this um, discussions on open government. Please uh, feel free to ask me anything, and uh, if you want to join any working sessions, any working groups, um, follow them. Sean, indeed, OGP has the potential to have impact, um, but Sean is wondering about being able to have granular continuous evaluation and then milestone uh, larger reports. Um, Sean, this is, this is something the steering committee is looking at. This is something that is still in the process. You know, open government partnership is just two years old. It is a very, very young initiative, and we really look forward for learning uh, from people like you, active people like you in, in, in your countries, and uh, um, we really look forward to hear from 
those engaged at the country level in, in action plans on open government and initiatives on open government. We will keep you posted. Please follow the Open Government Partnership webpage um, or write any um, any suggestions, any questions, and I, I will be more than happy to, to share more details with you. And thank you, thank you, Stephanie. And I, uh, on this last minute, I would really like to uh, thank Diplo Foundation for for the invitation to host this webinar today. Um, Diplo has always been um, looking at the emerging issues and. Uh, um, they're trying to take advantage of, uh, of uh, any opportunity that arises, you know, in the in the global agenda, global developmental agenda. So this is a huge, huge um, plus for Diplo. And um, thank you very much um, to my colleagues at Diplo for your support and for um, for for your initiative. And um, um, I look forward to um, staying in touch with you all afterwards. Thank you. I want to wish you all a great day ahead. And uh, again, uh, thank you very much for joining. And please feel free to contact me for any questions um, on, on this subject matter. Good luck to you in all your initiatives. Many thanks to you all. <laughs>